Well, good morning, church family, and Shabbat Shalom. My sermon today was on, um, actually it was, it was on discouragement was sort of the topic, but the idea of it was how to beat discouragement, how to overcome discouragement. So I guess, in essence, the, the whole purpose of it was encouragement, in fact. So I wanted to give you the backstory of, of what brought this about. Uh, it was about five years ago, <clears throat> after having um, some problems with my spinal cord, um, that I went in and I had extensive reconstructive surgery done of my cervical spine. And I had an enormous amount of hardware put in the back and in the front. Uh, in fact, we like to joke that I have more hardware in my spine right now than IL-14 at Home Depot. And, and, and what happened was everything was fine. And then probably about a, almost a year ago, I was starting to have more problems with coughing uh, and swallowing. So finally, this last week, I went to a, a gastroenterologist and I had an upper GI done where they put the tube down. You throw it to take a look and see what might be causing it. We had an idea what it might be, but what we found out was quite surprising. <clears throat> they sedate you to perform the procedure. And when I came out from under the sedation, the doctor was there, and I asked him, say, how did it go? And he said, you need to get to the emergency room at Tampa General Hospital right now. And he showed me the picture from the GI of my esophagus, and there was a piece of metal sticking through it. And I went immediately to the, um, to the emergency room, and they did x-rays and CAT scans. And what they found was that a piece of the hardware in the front of my neck had somehow dislodged or broken away, and it, and it um, penetrated uh, through my esophagus. It's a, um, almost always is a fatal situation because that causes a hole in the esophagus and food and, and liquids leak through there, get into the chest cavity, cause a, a fairly serious infection, and, and usually the mortality rate is very high. So I was just freaked out, you know, and they immediately admitted me to the hospital they um, uh, did surgery to put in a, a stomach tube because they don't want me, the doctor didn't want me swallowing anything anymore, water or food or anything until we could schedule the surgery. And the surgery was going to take a couple weeks to schedule because it required several different physicians and different disciplines and trying to get them all coordinated at the same time for what they told me is going to be an eight to 10 hour surgery was quite difficult. And I got to tell you, I was about as discouraged as I have ever been in my whole life. I was just, uh, I would say that I spent a couple days just depressed about the whole thing. And then, and then I remembered about um, the sermon that I had written that I was supposed to present that Sabbath. And I went back and I read through it and I read the verses and uh, Susan came and visited and we, we prayed and um, um, I realized that the numbers and the statistics really aren't as important um, as my faith in God. And, and so I've come back out of it a little bit. I'm still get a bit weak sometimes with that, but um, it's okay. And so I was motivated today from now of a more personal experience to deliver the sermon today, and that's what it's about. So we're going to go ahead and, uh, and get started on that. Thank you, and Shabbat Shalom. Number three, how are we doing? Good. All right. Thank you, Susan. You know how they say, is there a doctor in the house? We go, is there a prayer warrior in the house? Because that's what we need here, for sure. Uh, what Susan was talking about was Sunday, we were, I was in the hospital. Uh, she was there with me, and uh, they come in for vitals every four hours, whether you need sleep or not. And uh, um, I was facing this surgery uh, Monday to get this stuff prepped for the big surgery, and I was just nervous. You know, I was just having a lot of uh, discomfort. And uh, this lady, this aide comes in uh, to do the vitals. And she walks in the room singing this beautiful hymn. The whole time she took the vitals and she walked out. Did nothing but sing this beautiful hymn. It was Sabbath. Because that made it more Sabbath. Was it Sabbath? It was Sabbath. I'm so sorry. You're right. I apologize. It was Sabbath. And she came in and did that. And uh, it was just incredible. So, Well, this is the sermon I was going to do last week. But it means a little more to me today. 
So last Friday, a week ago yesterday, I went in for, you know, I've been having issues with swallowing and coughing a little more the last year than I normally had, and we thought it was one thing. And I went in last week for a routine upper GI, and they sedate you. And when I came out of sedation, the doctor was there, and I said, I said, so how'd it go? And he said, you need to get to the Tampa General Hospital emergency room right now. He said, you need emergency surgery. And he showed me the picture of it, and I was like, wow. That's cool, because I'd never seen anything like that before. And uh, so we went home and got some stuff together and went. But I had actually planned to go home after that test and to be home and then to come to church uh, the next day and do my sermon. And instead, I was in the hospital over in Tampa. And I experienced a wave of discouragement that I haven't in a long time because I went through this, as you know, five years ago, and it was 12 hours of surgery over two days, and I have, as we like to joke, I have more hardware in my neck than aisle 14 at Home Depot. Um. And, and the, I had sort of had this expectation, we'll talk about unrealized expectations, that that would be in there forever and I wouldn't have to deal with it. So when, when we met that first day with uh, the surgeons, the neurosurgeon, the um, thoracic surgeon, and the head and neck surgeon. And um, the neurosurgeon said, well, I'm just going to have to go in and pull all that hardware out. And I said, you're going to put it back in? He said, we can't, not for a while. So he said, you're going to next be a little bit unstable. It's just the back stuff that will be holding it. And you'll have a hard brace to wear for about three months. And then after three months, we'll probably have to go back in and reinstall the hardware in the front. And I was like going, this is six months of dealing with this. And I was so discouraged that I, I actually thought about the fact that I'd rather just take my chances, take a dirt nap. I'm ready anyway, you know. It's like I got nothing on my bucket list. So I thought I'd just take my chances, and whatever happens, happens. And Susan and I, we prayed about it, and we talked about it. And um, um, I made some phone calls. I talked to um, my friend Doug Batchelor and he prayed with me and I talked to Dr. Nedley and he prayed with me and he told me about when him and Erica were going through this where they thought she was dying of cancer. They read chapter 16 of Ministry of Healing every single day and that's what we've been doing. And so now I prefer not to take a dirt nap if not absolutely necessary um, but I was so discouraged I went through all of those phases I got depressed you know, during the week, and I was just, it was ridiculous. So what I did was I went back and I read my sermon. I said, wait a minute, didn't I just hear a sermon about that? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. So you're going to hear it today, because this is, this is what I wrote now, and I did some editing. This is for myself, is what I wrote it. So Joshua 1, 7 to 9 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. And we're not talking about prosperous there in money. And then you will have good success. And we're not talking about success in business there either. This is in our lives, in our spiritual lives, in our souls. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good what? Courage. Courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You can't hide from God. So let's start with a definition of what is discouragement. Well, it's interesting because if you look at the Latin component of dis um, coragio, it means to be without courage. Discouragement means that we have let fear overcome faith. Uh, um, Tim talked about it in the Bible study last night. We have to have faith all the time, and faith is a belief in something that's unseen. I have never personally met Jesus, shook hands with him, or fist bumped in these days, I guess, you know. But I know that God exists, and I know that the salvation story is true. I don't have a single question about it. You know, a friend of mine, uh, we were on the phone this morning, and he asked me, he said, so why do you think this happened? You think your DNA or whatever, you know, and some people would be like, you know, how, what's this God that you serve? 
if he allows these kind of things to happen. And I said, no, maybe it was that I was, uh, after a surgery where I was told to take it easy the rest of my life, I was shooting high-powered guns, I was riding the four-wheeler through the woods, I was tripping when I was hunting and falling, and maybe it's because I just didn't take it seriously and didn't take care of myself. My friend Henry Shaw used to say, when something bad happens to me, I never say, why me, God? Because I know why. But when something good happens, I say, why me, God? because I didn't deserve it. So discouragement simply means that fear has become more prominent than courage. It's also where we're disheartened or a feeling of despair in the face of obstacles. And it starts with just being frustrated. That's where discouragement comes from. So frustration is where I have unrealized expectations. I thought it would be different. I spent a lot of time recovering from that surgery last. In fact, it was a year it took me before I was, had any sense of normalcy. And I surely expected that the warranty was going to be more than the warranty on my car. Okay? And it wasn't. And so I was, but, but that's an unreal expectation because of the things that we do to pervert our human body. The things we do not to take care of ourselves and, and what happens to us. It's also about self-centeredness. And that was the first question I asked you got to be kidding me. What about me? I don't deserve this. And that was the wrong thing to say because the truth is I do deserve this in the sense that I don't deserve anything good. I've done nothing in my life to earn God's love or his grace. It comes as a gift from him. And also self-reliance. You know, I can do this myself. I don't need anyone to help me. I can diagnose this, treat it, figure it out, and, and do what I want to do. And... Um, you know, I was just so frustrated when we got through this thing. I want to talk about this unrealized expectations. This is biblical. In Matthew 27, 41 to 43, it says when Jesus is on the cross, it says he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. The expectation that somehow somebody, some human force could hold Jesus Christ to the cross. Nobody killed Jesus. Jesus went willingly and, and died for us to take our sins that each of us would have a promise of eternal life. He could have blinked. Remember, I mean, the story about when Peter cut off the guard's ears. Before that, they came to him and they said, are you, you know, who you are? And he said, I am. And, and those words were so powerful that it knocked down an entire, what, what was it, like a company of Roman soldiers in their chain mail, in their armor, with their weapons. He just knocked them down with two words, I am. He could have blinked and wiped everyone into oblivion, jumped off the cross and continued on, but he didn't. Because if he had, then the mission to save us would have failed. He trusted in God, even in his humanity. When he said, Lord, if there's any other way out of this, let's find it. But if not, let it be your will that proceeds. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And in Luke 24, 21, it says, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Remember the Pharisees, they thought when the, when the Messiah came, he would make them a nation of kings and he was making them a nation of servants instead. And they didn't like that. They wanted to be on the top controlling things not on the bottom, just spreading the message. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. So we live sometimes in a world of unrealized expectations. We expect people to act a certain way. We expect things to go a certain way. We expect things to happen the way we want them to happen. And when they don't, we, sometimes we act like a bunch of toddlers, you know? I mean, that's just the way it happens. I did this at the hospital. I had to stay an extra almost two days because I couldn't get one physician to come see me for three minutes to give me my discharge, discharge orders. And I was just, I couldn't believe it. And I fully expected that this person would act as a professional and do their job and do it the way that you might expect a professional would, and they didn't. And so I was living in these unrealized expectations. And it wasn't until I took a deep breath and I prayed about it and said, look, this is going to happen in God's time, not in my time. Um, I'm not the chairman of the results committee. 
time. <laughs> also occurs because of poor communication. Job 15, 2 to 5 says, Then Job spoke again. Right, This is after his friends had just sort of castigated him for his situation and all the things he could, probably did wrong and could have done right. And he says, I have heard all this before. What miserable comforters you are. If you got nothing nice to say, just go home is what Job was saying to them. Won't you ever stop blowing hot air? What makes you keep on talking? I could say the same things if you were in my place. I could, bless you, I could spout off criticism and shake my head at you. But if it were me, I would encourage you. I would try to take away your grief. Instead, I suffer if I defend myself and I suffer if I refuse to speak. You know, if somebody's in a tough situation and you don't have anything encouraging to say, it's best just to keep your mouth shut. That's my experience, you know? Uh, I, I remember a long time ago, um, I had a friend of mine, uh, Eddie, and he, uh, he broke his arm, he got a compound fracture of his arm, so he had to get surgery and pins, and he had it in a cast, and it was around his neck, and we were going over to, um, uh, to my buddy Jeff's house, to hang out and hit Jeff's mom was home and as we were walking in the house uh, she saw his arm and she said oh what did you do to anger God I'm like whoa you know I mean I couldn't believe it um how about hey are you okay is there anything you need I'm sorry this happened to you I'm going to pray for you kind of thing it's also as we talked about the results of frustration we get anger towards ourselves and others this is what happens when I get frustrated I was so angry at that doctor when they said the one time he was coming up, I said, tell him not to. Just tell him not to come up here, come up in his rounds this afternoon. Because I'm so mad right now that I'm afraid I won't control myself. I won't act not only like a Christian, but not even like a human being. So just tell him to come up in rounds this afternoon. And he, and he, and he did. Um, resentments, right? Against people, places, organizations, and things. When things don't go our way, what do we do? We start to get resentments towards those entities that we believe cause that to happen. And we also begin to move away from God. I, I felt that in the hospital. When that anger stirred up, and I mean, you know, I got to tell you, I went back to street. That's how I felt. I was scared to death. I didn't know if I was going to live or die, and I couldn't get somebody to help me. And I went back to like that place I was long before I was a Christian. And it took me way too long to realize that's where I was. And I was ashamed of myself for being there. But you know what? Again, I pray about it, and uh, I, I, you know, I call, I get on the phone, and I call one of my spiritual partners, and, and, and I get myself back centered. Again, because if you move away from God too long, what we end up is we lose total perspective of reality. And when that happens, we're on our own. We're, we're pushing God away, and, um, and uh, we, we end up in a place where we become so overwhelmed that we can't function. I don't know if you've ever been there. I have. I have been so overwhelmed that I can't even function anymore. You know? Exodus 6, 6-9 says, Therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and I will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. I call upon that promise every single day. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. This is the perspective that we, meet, that we need to maintain all of the time. So Moses, it says, told the people of Israel what the Lord said, but they refused to listen anymore. They had become too what? Too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. 400 years of slavery, and they became so discouraged that they couldn't even hear the encouraging words that came from God anymore. You know what I just noticed? I haven't eaten in like two weeks. I don't cough anymore, <clears throat> and my throat doesn't get as bad. So I think... Maybe I'm just not going to eat again. And, <laughs> and that'll be it. Wow, how easy was that? Let's close up and go home. <laughs> we also begin to blame other people. 
we begin to lose accountability. And I will tell you that it's my opinion, so you can choose to disagree with it. This is the world according to Frank. But it's my opinion that taking personal accountability for where we are in our lives is about the most important thing that a Christian can do. Because here's the problem. If I don't take responsibility for what's happening to me right now, then I have no choice but to blame somebody else. The devil made me do it. Well, that can't be true because I have Jesus Christ on my side. And if the devil made me do it, it's because I chose to listen to the devil rather than to listen to Jesus. That's my responsibility, and I am wholly accountable for that. And if you get nothing out of this whole sermon today, I would just encourage you, of all the things you hear, is to take a look at where you are in your life and the things that are happening to you, and don't blame anybody else for it. Take whole personal responsibility. Because no matter what it is, you had a part to play in it somewhere. You know, I could say, hey, it's not my fault, it's the doctor's fault. But why do you have to do this in the first place? You know, because of things that I did where I didn't take care of myself the way I should have, and this is the consequence that occurs from that. I am wholly accountable for this. Now, maybe he made a mistake, so I still have a part to play in what happened throughout this. We have to be very careful with that. Genesis 3, 8 to 13, I'm just reading the story. We've read it a billion times. Sorry, that's hyperbolic. We've read it probably dozens, if not hundreds of times. And, and, um, but I want to read it because it, I need to hear this. It says, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from him, from the Lord God among the trees. And the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. I love this, my, one of my favorite sentences in the whole Bible. God says, who told you that? Who told you that? Where did that authority come from that somebody told you you were naked and you believed that? Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And the man replied, <laughs> it was the woman you gave me who made me eat the fruit and I ate it. It was her fault. And the woman said, when God asked the woman, what have you done? She said, it was the serpent's fault. He deceived me. She replied, that's why I ate it. I mean, the first sorry, sad excuse came right there in the Garden of Eden. The first case of not taking personal responsibility for our actions and accepting where we are today because of our own behaviors and our own choices. And we've got to get out of that. We will never recover from the sicknesses and the diseases that we have until we, I believe, until we get to that point. What happens when we become discouraged? We're resigned to failure. We stop saying, I make mistakes, and we start saying, I am a mistake. And that's a sin, because God created me in his image. I'm not a mistake. <laughs> but, but I make a lot of mistakes. We begin to rebel, not just against God, against authority, against our brothers and our sisters. We suffer disappointments and we get further separated from God and separation and isolation from other believers and eventually we end up with depression. Do you know that over the last two years, suicide rates due to this whole thing because of depression increases in people with depression has, I read, increased something like 400%. That's just unacceptable in the society. In a society where God is available to all of us, unlike some communist nation where they have to hide, in a free society where Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God is, and that whole concept of the salvation message is available to all of us, that anybody should take their life without first having the opportunity to know God, is un, it's inexcusable. It just shouldn't happen. Uh, but it does. You know, Remember, the road to perdition, it says, is what? And how many people? It says many. And the road to heaven is? And how many? Again, I've always, as a, as a mathematician, I've always wanted, I wish God would have put the numbers in. I wish he would have said 88.4% um, um, are going to not make it, and uh, you know, 11.6% are going to make it, or something like that. I don't know what the ratio is, but I know that with, 
It it's just it boggles my mind. Now it does. Before I was a Christian, I got it. I didn't know anything about this. But now, as a believer, it boggles my mind that anybody who has heard the message of salvation would reject it. Why in the world would you do that? It doesn't make any sense to me. But, but it's the majority, apparently, the overwhelming majority, the many, that's what they're going to do. And it's only the few that will accept the message of God. We then give up on hope. Again, I'll go back to Job 16, 7 to 14. He says, Surely, O God, you have worn me out. You have devastated my entire household. You have bound me, and it has become a witness. My gauntness rises up and testifies against me. God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. My opponent fastens on me with his piercing eyes. Men open their mouths to jeer at me. They strike my cheek in scorn and unite together against me. God has turned me over to evil men and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. All was well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck and crushed me. He has made me his target. His archers surround me. Without pity, he pierces my kidneys and spills my gall on the ground. Again and again, he bursts upon me. He rushes at me like a warrior. You know why I love this verse? Because I actually don't feel so bad about my situation anymore. If this is all that's happening to me right now, I got it made. If I don't survive it, no big deal. I sleep until the Lord returns. Job, look what he had to put up with for as long as he did. And while he was suffering from the physical ailments, he had to reel in the loss of his family, everybody, and his friends who just came and criticized him and castigated him and told him all the things he was doing wrong. Like That's really what he needed to hear at that time. But here's the psychology of it. To go from bad to better, or to best, you only have to go from bad to good. And that's all that basically happens. Have you ever noticed when things are bad, they always get worse? What else could go wrong? Don't ever ask that question in a crisis. Trust me. Have you ever noticed when things are good, they just tend to get better? Because in the normal brain chemistry of a human being, unless you have some, some serious bless you, brain problem like schizophrenia or, or multiple personality or something, in the normal human brain, I didn't know this, I, read, I was reading on this, it's pretty fascinating, you can only experience one emotion at a time. I don't know what that was, where did that come from? Only one emotion at a time, okay? You can either have a negative emotion or a positive emotion, you can't experience both, okay? So when things are bad, and this probably comes from one of the laws of, thermo, of thermodynamics, it says that a, um, a physics, I'm sorry, second law, it says that a body in motion tends to stay in motion yeah. and a body at rest tends to stay at rest. It takes more energy to take a body from rest into motion than it does to maintain the motion. So it takes less energy when something is bad to get worse because those negative emotions begin to cascade. It's easier when things are good to get better because the positive emotions tend to cascade. So when things are bad, all you have to do is have one positive event. That's all. Just one thing. You know what I like to do? I like to go out and do something, help somebody out anonymously, give somebody some money if they need it, or, or if I see somebody who's homeless, to, to bring them something that they need, or, or to donate to a ministry, something to help another person out. And it stops the the left side of the number line stops the cycle and that one good thing then, the next thing tends to be positive as well. And so that's all we have to do. It just requires one positive event. So what can we do? What's realistic? We can believe and we can pray. That's what we can do. For the disheartened, there is a sure remedy, faith, prayer, and work. Faith and activity will impart assurance and satisfaction that will increase day by day. Are you tempted to give way to feelings of anxious foreboding or utter despondency? Me. In the darkest days when appearances seem most forbidding, fear not. Have faith in God. He knows your need. He has all power. His infinite love and compassion never weary. Fear not that he will fail of fulfilling his promise. He is eternal truth. Never will he change the covenant 
he has made with those who love him. And he will bestow upon his faithful servants the measure of efficiency that their needs demand. God will never put in front of us more than what he knows that we can handle. The Apostle Paul has testified. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. I hope I get really weak soon. Weaker than I am now. Because... There's no human solution to what's going on. And I need God right now more than I ever have in my whole life. Realistically, we have to encourage one another. 2 Corinthians goes on, chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. What a wonderful God we have. Now, there's enough encouragement just in that sentence right there. He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of every mercy and the one who so wonderfully comforts and strengthens us in our hardships and trials. And why does he do this? So this is one of my favorite parts of, of the Bible. Why does God comfort us when we're in distress? Is it so we would feel comfortable? There's actually three reasons that the Bible talks about. One is so that we would learn that we're not God. Learn this helplessness. We have to depend on God. The second is that we can comfort others. And we've had that experience, right? And the third part of it is that we will learn to rely on God on a regular basis for, for our um, survival, actually, in this world. So it goes on to say this. It says, and why does he do this? So that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass on to them the same help and comfort that God, God has given us. You know, I have, a, I have a mission now. I have an assignment from God. If I ever come across anybody else who potentially has what might be a lethal situation and they're despondent and scared, it's my job to say, yeah, this is what Jesus did for me. Amen. You can be encouraged, right? There's a saying in, in the 12-step fellowships and in, in one called Narcotics Anonymous. It says the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is without parallel. Parallel For one addict can best understand, um, help and understand another addict. We might say that here. The therapeutic value of one sinner helping another sinner is without parallel because, um, because, the therapeutic, because one sinner can best understand and help another sinner, right? If, if we are in with God, it says that we can pass on to them the same help and comfort God has given us. You can be sure that the more we undergo sufferings for Christ, the more he will shower us with his comfort and his encouragement. We are in deep trouble for bringing you God's comfort. We are in deep trouble for bringing you God's comfort and salvation. But in our trouble, God has comforted us, and this too, to help you, to show you from our personal experience how God will tenderly comfort you when you undergo these same sufferings. He will give you the strength to endure. Let me show you. Distress, comfort. No distress, no need for comfort, right? Um, a little distress, a little comfort. More distress, more comfort. A lot of distress, or down this way, distress, a lot of comfort. And what happens? Mathematically, the median line stays the same, where we don't need any comfort from anything else because we get it from God. God normalizes our distress to a point where it would be if we didn't have distress without the comfort. So distress and comfort is the same for a Christian as just being without the distress. He removes that from us. And he gives us the experience we need to go help another person out. Depend on God. That's the next. Mark 10, 27 says, But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, what? All things are possible. Isaiah 35, 10, And the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. And the last suggestion I would give you, the second to last slide, though, is stop whining. Oh, well, life is tough, and then you don't die. People say, oh, life is too short. No, life is too long, right? I mean, if life was that short, suffering a little bit wouldn't be a problem. But life's long enough that suffering can be a problem. And so we need to accept the fact that we are where we are. 
I, I remember one time I was in this whining stage and, and Susan said to me, she said, look down. And now I can't anymore because I can't look down. But if I did, she'd say, what do you see? And I'd say, my feet. And she'd say, where are they? I said, they're right here. And she said, exactly. Listen, I can't change what's happened. I can't predict the future. I can just tell you that I am where I am right now. Amen. And God's grace is sufficient for today. If I start getting into yesterday and I start freaking out about tomorrow, maybe there's not enough grace left because it says my grace is sufficient for today. It doesn't say my grace is sufficient for yesterday's worries and tomorrow's worries. It says for today. So I, I just got to stay in today, one day at a time. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29 says, Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped five times without number and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I faced danger from them, rivers and from robbers. I faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I faced danger in the cities and the deserts and on the seas. And I faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked long Hard and long, and during many sleepless nights, I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Wah, wah, wah. But what does he say when he goes on to say this? He says, I'm not saying this for me. He says, then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern with all you guys. Who is weak without my feeling that weakness? Who is led astray? And I do not burn with anger. Because God is with him. He calls upon the Lord in order to gain the strength to be able to do this. I read this and I think, I'm going, where's that doctor? Why isn't he showing up yet? How come I can't eat? My tomb hurts. I, yeah, you know? I need to change clothes. My pillow's not soft. And I go back and I read this verse and, and this is serious stuff. Gunshot, snake bit, stab, burnt. I mean, you name it. He went through it all. And did he ever for a second Abandon his mission of preaching the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Not for a second. Shame on me. Shame on me. So in closing, I want you to make a pact of non-discouragement. Make an agreement with yourself. The Lord loves you. The Lord is of tender compassion. This is from the Spirit of Prophecy. His promise is, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up for you a standard against him. Bear in mind that Jesus Christ is your hope. In the sad, discouraging things that shall come to you at any time, Christ says to you, let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. And I'm grateful that I had got to do the sermon <laughs> the week after I had wanted to do it because it means so much more to me now. I get it. It was just a sermon last week. Today, it is a life lesson that I've had to learn. You know? And I pray that, that for each of you it will uh, be as well. Um, all right, we're going to close in our usual way with some beautiful music and a song and a prayer. Well, thank you for your patience and tolerance today and again for your continued prayers uh don't forget to pray for susan too because while i'm unconscious for those eight or ten hours in that blissful propofol sleep she won't be she'll be there having to deal with what you know the unknown or not knowing so please remember to keep her in your prayers Amen. so i have a challenge and i, I told you what was going to be earlier T take some time today and, and just do some deep soul searching do an inventory that's all. Write it down. Take responsibility for where you are in your life. At least for the role that you had to play in it. Don't blame other people and never blame God. Because, you know, I was, I don't know where we were at a funeral for a friend or something. They lost a child and someone, well, that's God's will. That is not true. That's a lie. That's right. It's never God's will that anybody should die or perish. It's God's will that we should all have been 
having this eternal life here, but we did it. It was sin. We read it in Genesis. It was the original sin, and we now suffer from it. Were we responsible? Did we eat the forbidden fruit? No, but have we not persisted in continuing in sin throughout our lives as well? You know what? The fact that we're all here above ground in a free country, in a church, worshiping, speaks just speaks gallons to God's grace. Amen. Because none of us deserve to be here. Yeah. That's right. Amen. But we are by God's grace. Praise God Amen. every day, every moment you can. Amen. Let us close with prayer. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Wait, 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 wait.